So it's really great meeting all of you, even though I can't see you, I can feel your energy about cleaning. And um, this is really good because Thanksgiving is coming up, Christmas is coming up, and if you have visitors, you're going to be cleaning your house. So this is a great topic for this time of the year. So I've given this class, I'd say, many times to over 200 people, and um, everybody gets something out of it in a different way, but everybody likes the recipes that Alyssa will share with you at the end, and I'll be talking about some of them at the end also. So first, though, I'd love to get started by just talking a little bit about why we're doing this in the first place, because this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, is what we use to clean our houses with. And we can um, think about all the chemicals that we've been exposed to in our whole entire life. This starts when we're not, before we're even born. And this is called our body burden, which is all the toxicants we accumulate in our lifetime from before we're born till the time um, we we pass away and we get these uh, toxicants from a lot of different sources and environments and the first one is the outdoor environment and you know we were exposed to air pollution um, one of the projects that i worked on was the um uh, Tonawanda Coke project at UB. So that would, that involved air pollution, um, pesticide pollution, um, even pharmaceuticals and water. If we don't dispose of our pharmaceuticals and our drugs in the right way, and we just dump them down the sink, that becomes part of the ecosystem. Um, and, and water supply companies can't always get those things out. It can be from our food, like um, any pesticide residue that might be located on our apples or our broccoli, um, artificial food colorings, nitrates, nitrites that they use in some foods. PFOA is now big in the news. This is um, a, a kind of chemical that is used on those nonstick um pans that you may have in your own house, but it's one of those chemicals that has a very, very, very long lifespan. It lasts in the environment and doesn't go away. And actually this PFOA is causing problems right now in water systems um, across the country, even in New York State. And then there's chemicals that we may find in fish and meat. Um, and and they come especially from the environment that the fish f find themselves in. And in Western New York, here in the Great Lakes, that's a problem because we have some legacy chemicals in our water supply um, that have been there from pollutants um, historically 80 years ago, 50 years ago, and they don't break down. So we have to be careful for your fisher person, um, how how you eat your fish that come from the Great Lakes. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on the indoor environment, our home, our school, our workplace. Um, this is all where we're going to be finding chemicals that people have cleaned these um, locations with. And especially we're going to be focusing on our home right now. Um, and but I can also say that in our indoor environment, we also get pollutants from furniture, cleaners, rugs, tobacco smoke, and personal care products even, um, just like our um, sh shampoos, our soaps, things like that. And so one of the things to note is that, as you see here on the bottom of this slide, there have been more than 85,000 chemicals that have been developed in the last 60 years alone. So many of the chemicals that are in our lives now, especially exploded after World War II. There were a lot of chemical companies working um, during the war effort um, to create things that were needed I guess by the military. And then um, they became part of our lives just automatically, but nobody ever tested them for safety. This means that they were grandfathered in. And, and then since that time, many, many, many more chemicals have been developed, including PFOA. So why is this important to us? Why is indoor air quality, why should we care? So in um, 
our country, as in many of the world, um, we spend about 90% of our time indoors. So the indoor environment is where we're going to pick up a lot of these toxicants that may affect our body burden or our, our chemical, our, our uh, makeup in our body. And people have found that when they've studied this, that there are some pollutants that can be much higher indoors than outdoors. In fact, two to five times higher. And this all depends upon what kind of things you use in your house, what kind of um, rugs you have in your house, furniture you have in your house, because new furniture, new rugs, as you know, have that new rug smell. And those are actually volatile organic compounds being released into the air. Um, and again, you see the next uh, bullet point here. These VOCs, that's what they're called in short, VOCs can be up to 10 times higher indoors than outdoors. So do you use air fresheners in your house, aerosol sprays? Um, do you use disinfectants and any cleaners? Anything actually with a fragrance also can start emitting these VOCs. And these chemicals are the kind of chemicals that contaminate the air because at just a room temperature, they become emitted from um, objects. And this is sort of like, as I said, this you know new rug smell, the new car smell. These are all VOCs that you're inhaling. Um, and most people, um, you know, people can be susceptible, but then in particular, there's certain populations that are really susceptible to these indoor pollutants. And this includes children. Their bodies are really small. Their organs haven't developed quite yet. So um, as an adult, we have some um, systems in our body, including our kidney, including our liver that help to remove some toxicants. It can't remove all toxicants, but it can remove some of them. But in children, these aren't fully developed yet. Um, also, their organ systems like their brain are still developing. So um, they are more susceptible also in that way because their organ systems are also developing and we don't want any kind of toxicant to interfere with that. Um, elderly, um, their immune systems, as the older you get, the, the less your immune system is as robust as when you were younger. Um, and you may also have more, um, you know, chronic conditions, including cardiovascular or respiratory diseases. And so people that have asthma or COPD or lung diseases, these are also populations that are susceptible to these pollutants in the air. And by the way, I should also let you know that dust in our homes um, can contain chemicals that we inhale. So if you use an air freshener, for example, in your house, you know that it does its work because it creates aerosolized products, little particles you don't necessarily see, um, but that contain a fragrance and whatever else that they contain. Um, once they're sort of out of the atmosphere in your house, they settle down onto surfaces in your house, like your rugs, like your furniture. And then if you walk on your rug or you vacuum or you dust, um, this can all activate these particles that have landed on dust particles and we put them into the air again so you can have another chance to inhale them. And people actually have done a lot of studies on dust in the home and the chemicals um, that are present on dust particles. So when you think about cleaning products, um, cleaning products are linked to health effects that may be immediate or long term. And so I'm going to stop here and this is a, um, a part where Alyssa can help me out and you guys can put in the chat. Have you ever, when you cleaned anything, experienced any kind of effect from a cleaning product as you were cleaning? So I'll give you a couple of seconds if, if you want to put something in the chat. And I just want to quickly mention if I see we have a couple people on cell phones. Um, yeah. So for a cell phone person to act or a tablet person to access your chat screen, um, it says you should touch your screen, which will bring up a control panel and then click the button that has three dots in it. And that's where you will find your chat. Okay. So 
So I saw someone say coughing. Was that right? Yes, coughing. Yeah, a couple people said coughing. Mm hmm. Anybody else? I've had the watery eye issue myself. Have you? Yeah. Um, and also, your nose may have been affected. What did Ed say? And I'm Ed said when he uses something with ammonia in it, he's experienced a shortness of breath. Ah. Ed, thank you for that, Ed. Um, that's a good one too. So coughing, you know, you see that you're experiencing the people who have responded are respiratory issues mostly. So that's really um, where you're gonna face a lot of the acute um, or immediate responses to a certain chemicals. Um, and that could be skin irritation, as, as you mentioned, all of you, respiratory irritation, um, Alyssa said watery eyes. Now, if you're using a chemical, I mean, a product like a toilet bowl cleaner or an oven cleaner that may maybe has very acidic or basic pHs, you could actually get a chemical burn on your skin if you are not following the directions very carefully. And actually, um, asthma attacks. So many of you uh, know, you know, Many of these uh, products have very strong smells um, and like uh, bleach has a very strong smell, ammonia, a very strong smell. And if you have um, 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 asthma already, it can trigger an asthma attack um, in you. But another piece to this picture are the long term or chronic effects that we can experience and this in in particular can influence people like janitors or people that have been exposed to these chemicals in some way for a long time. And these can be cancer, um, hormone disruption, and we'll talk a little bit about hormone disruption in a bit, asthma, uh, and there's been a study, a couple studies done on um, new onset asthma and looking at janitors. So if you had a job as a janitor and you came to this job without any problems at all, 20 years later, you may have experienced that you now have asthma because of the smells of this cleaning product and, and that effect on your lungs. Um, reproductive problems, developmental problems, liver and kidney damage. And remember we talked about the fact that some of our organs help us get rid of toxicants from our environment. And those two key organs are liver and kidney. This is why they may be organs that are damaged from certain chemicals because you're, these chemicals are, you know, the organs are trying to get rid of them. And um, the central nervous system can also be damaged. So these are long-term chronic effects. Um, and I also wanna say, that in having worked in um, for a while in a public health field, when when the EPA um, or an, a regulatory body like the EPA, they're responsible for telling you, you know, um, if, for trying to analyze the risk to the population, not to you individually, but to a population. So they usually use like risk things like one in a million cancer deaths. One in a hundred thousand will get asthma. This is their role. Um, it doesn't mean that you yourself will either get it or not, and they don't know your particular body vulnerabilities. So this is this is something to be be thoughtful of is that there's there's a public health risk and then there's the risk that you may face that is unique to you. And then I also want to put into this picture, the sustainability picture, the and the um, um, sort of the social and environmental justice picture is that when we think about these chemicals, we can think about it in terms of its effect on ourselves. We can think of it in terms of effect on our community. So maybe we live near a plant that's making something um, and we could be vulnerable because they're making large amounts of this this whatever it is um and but it can also be for the workers themselves um the workers who make certain chemicals are being exposed to um to a higher osha require you know their level of um acceptability for a worker is higher than the risk 
for the population as a whole. Um, and so that's another um, population to consider as well as the environment, the fish, the trees, etc. So these are all kind of putting it all in the biggest picture possible from the smallest to the biggest picture. So I want to go over some chemicals that are found in cleaning products. And this leads us to the question you may begin to wonder as we start talking is, do you have to be a chemist to clean your house safely? So um, you're going to find that when you look at the back of um, any kind of product that you may be using, you might see nonophenyl ethoxylates on there and you'll be like, what, what is that? You know, um, and so we need to uh, kind of be familiar with some terms, but I think at the end of this uh, webinar, we'll show you an easier way rather than trying to remember all of this stuff. So some chemicals that you're going to find commonly, and this is just some of them, um, uh, but I wanted to point out some common ones. So phthalates. Phthalates are chemicals that are often found in fragrances. And as you know, um, most products you may see on the shelves have a fragrance to them. Um, and so many times these fragrances are known as a trade secret. Um, and we'll go over this a bit, but fragrances contain lots of different chemicals that all work together to create this certain smell for you. And so the company doesn't necessarily have to tell you what's in those fragrances because it's a trade secret. Therefore, if this is a problem for you, it's going to be hard for you to figure out what chemical in that fragrance may be causing a reaction. But fragrances, as I said, are linked to asthma, endocrine disruption. So endocrine disruption is another way of saying hormone disruption, the same sort of thing. Um, hormones, um, as you know, in our, our part of our body, it's our growth hormone, it's, um, you know, testosterone, estrogen, um, we have many hormones and hormones are really important in our body, but they only, you only need them when you need them. You only need them um, in, a, in very minute quantities. So it's a problem when a chemical um, mimics um, a hormone, so makes our cells think that the hormone is available when it's really not, it's the, it's the chemical, because they look chemically so similar. Um, and it, so that's one problem that a chemical um, can cause endocrine disruption. And then reproductive prog problems can be um, related to some of the chemicals and fragrances. Triclosan, you may hear this often in the TV ads or things also as microban or biofresh. And these were often part of anti antibacterial products. These are still part of them, um, including dishwashing liquids. And they cause, they can cause um, in the right amounts, um, endocrine disruption, breast cancer, very toxic to aquatic life, and it persists in the environment. So um, this is one of those chemicals that you want to be aware of because of its persistence. Anything that persists in, in the environment is a worry, at least to me, because the environment is part of me too. So I don't want it to persist in the environment, nor do I want it to persist in me. <laughs> and um, just to make this also this link is that there are some breast cancers that are hormone um, kinds of breast cancers that are caused by um, hormone activation. So you see this kind of uh, similarity here. Um, and then there's ethanolamines, and you're going to see this on the labels, maybe in, in any product you may have that has this as MEA, DEA, or TEA, mono, di, or triethanolamines. These are all slightly different chemical formulations, um, structures of ethanolamines. They can be found in laundry detergents, spot removers, et cetera. And again, you're going to see some commonality here, asthma, skin allergies, respiratory toxicant, again, a developmental and reproductive toxicant, cancer, and kidney damage. There are, these are chemicals that are linked to some of these. Again, using it one time, using it many times, um, you know, the, the, the risk is 
more and more, the more you are in touch with this so that um, the more you use a certain product, the um, more like a worker will be creating this project product and be in touch with it. These are all the ways that risk begins to increase. Um, ammonium quaternary compounds, also known as quats, these are often part of disinfectants. You're going to find them in disinfectant wipes and sprays, all-purpose cleaners, toilet bowl cleaners, and these um, are associated with asthma. So these are. Uh, strongly like an occupational source of asthma, also uh, linked to developmental and reproductive toxicity. Alkylphenol ethoxylates, and these also have certain um, chemical structures that may be slightly di different. Nonylphenol, octylphenol ethoxylates, these are found in multi surface and floor cleaners. Um, these can also cause endocrine disruption. They're an environmental toxicant, again, another environmental toxicant. And in the process of creating the alkylphenol ethoxylates, um, a chemical reaction can occur. Um, as the production is going on that is unintended, that produces 1,4-dioxane, and this is a carcinogen. So, bef so uh, producers didn't know this, product manufacturers didn't know this for a while, that, that this unintended, uh, this is an unintended product of producing um, alkyl phenyl ethoxylates and products with that. And then 2-butoxyethanol has a whole lot of different names called Dowanol and EGBA, EGBE, making it very hard for us to keep track of this, right? And it's found in glass cleaners, degreasers, carpet stain removers, for example. Again, a link to asthma, cancer, birth defects, kidney and liver toxicants. So here we are in our grocery store. And we are just a normal consumer, and we're going to try and do the right thing, and we're going to find that this is really confusing. Um, not your fault, because one, as we talked about, there's very complicated ingredient names here, right? It's nothing that rolls off your tongue. Dimethyl benzyl ammonium chloride is not a common um, thing we talk about at a party. Um, lots of different names for the same ingredient. So you see here that these are all the same chemical, 2-butoxyethanol, N-butoxyethanol, butyl cellulose, et cetera. These are all the same thing, so it will be hard for you to get a handle on all these different names. Um, also, all ingredients aren't listed on the label. So, especially like as you, as I told you about fragrances, you'll see that this is not all those chemicals that make up the fragrances are not going to be listed on the label. It's going to just say fragrance. Um, also, some some companies are starting to list all the ingredients, but some still don't. Um, and then there are family of compounds, as we talked about with MEA, DEA. Um, TEA um, that are slightly different chemically, and they may have different health and environmental effects. And then, as we talked about with 1,4-dioxane, there may be impurities in a product that could be a health hazard. So let me ask you, have you ever heard anybody say these things, or maybe you've said it yourself? Um, I know I've heard people say, I don't think my bathroom is, is clean until I smell bleach. Or I really like all these fragrances, and I have Yankee candles in my house, and you know this air freshener in my house, and I love all these different kinds of fragrances um, in my house. So I don't know if, if um, those of you who, who want, have you had friends or maybe even yourself who says these sorts of things? I saw something pop up. I only see them pop up briefly, so I, I don't know. I heard bo both frequently. Um, he's heard, someone responded, they've heard both of these frequently. And I know I have a friend that uses that Bath and Body Works candles and the oh, yeah. air fresheners in the home and they smell so strong it makes me sick my, i literally yes. get a headache and feel like i'm going to vomit when i when i go over there she has to turn them off for me so yes. I know that that's one brand i know of does anybody else have anything to add yeah so i you know Alyssa, i'm glad you said that is that 
over the years, as I learned more, I mean, I grew up um, in a family that used um, really strongly smelling detergents, laundry detergents and um, uh, furniture polishes and, and window cleaners. And um, as I, you know, lived my life and learned more, I, I got rid of, I mean, those things weren't part of my life and they haven't been for decades. And, um, and so when I now, am, I'm in a place, as you say, with that, I immediately get a headache. It really affects me. Um, and I am aware as how like being away from it has made my sensitivity to it so much more um, strong. That's so, really interesting. Yeah. 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 So it may be that, you know, when, when, uh, even I, even when I walk down the trail, I walk at Rhinestein Woods a lot, and um, and I am people spray bug spray or or have used laundry um, uh, those laundry sheets, and they walk by me. I'm like, oh, the laundry sheet. <laughs> you can smell it. So so I can yeah. I just became very sensitive to it. So anyways, here I wanted to just uh, talk to you about these fragrances since we mentioned it. Is that um, like we talked about fragrances? They're really you know like I think in Delaware is where they have these perfume factories or something. I think I read that somewhere. Well, there's all these chemists you know in their labs working on how to make a nice lavender smell or a um, rain scent or whatever it may be, um, and they can contain three thousand separate chemicals to make that kind of smell. And they can these chemicals can contain parabens phthalates, octoxanols, um, all these different chemicals we just talked about that have these varying um, health effects. And again, as we talked about through the house dust, um, breakdown products of these chemicals can persist in the environment. Sometimes some chemicals may land on a dust particle and then the sunlight coming through your house is an energy source that can break down some of the chemicals to other chemicals that still persist in your environment in your house. One of the most concerning biological act actions of fragrances is some of the chemicals ability to mimic or block normal hormone functioning. And again, this is what we mean by endocrine disruptors and our endocrine system is very sensitive and we are faced um, daily with many, many types of endocrine disruptors in our life um, through these all these various products. Um, I forgot, I looked this up once and I forgot the number of how many endocrine disruptors are out there at the present time. Um, but this is what is impacting our body daily. Um, and this, this is why I think sometimes when you think about um, on why certain diseases may be prevalent or something, we are exposed you know, uh, when when studies are done on certain chemicals, they are done one by one. Okay, what does this chemical do? What does that chemical do? But but it is very hard to to kind of get a handle on the mix of chemicals that we're exposed to, not only from one product, the mix of chemicals in that one product, but then the daily mix that we're exposed to every day and how that all those mixtures within our body react. So that's another thing. So health, health effects of some of these things you'll see affect immune system functioning, diabetes, thyroid problems, immune problems, um, birth defects, reproductive problems, and cancer. So what's in the cleaners that we use every day? Um, Okay, Alyssa, here's where I'm going to try this out. Well, first I'll tell you this. Um, let me, yeah, first I'll do this. Um, this is an organization called in the Environmental Working Group. And I'm going to try and share my screen with you. I don't know how this is gonna go. Um, now I'm still sharing this, so let me just. Um... So what we're trying to do here, guys, is take the PowerPoint down and put up the link to the Environmental Working Group. So Donna is able to show you different products and how you can go about checking these products um, that you might use every day in your home. Okay, so bear so with us me... just one moment. Okay, you guys see this? Yep. Uh, 
All right. So I'm happy to this worked. This is the I wanted to show you this more um, in, in person. This is the environmental working group. They have a guide to healthy cleaning and you can search more than 2500 products on this website. So I'd love one person here to put in the chat one product. That's a common product that um, they'd like to learn about. Okay, so why don't why doesn't someone volunteer a cleaning product or a, a laundry detergent, a specific laundry detergent, or something that we can use as an example on the website here? You're getting anything? Not yet. No? I think it takes a minute to go through. Okay. Burex free and clean. Okay. So thank you, Barb. Was that Barb? Barb, we have Purex free and clean and then Clorox non bleach cleaner for bathrooms and Windex. So we got okay, three so, back. Um, okay. So I may not be able to have time. I don't know. We'll see. Purex free and clean. Free and clean. There are zero results for my search. Wait, I think I spelled it wrong. Oh, there. Nope, nothing. Let me just put Purex. See, what happens is that companies change their names so fast. This is a relatively good guide for most products. Okay, here we are, Purex. Now, I don't see Purex free and clean. Exactly. So, how about if I choose one of these? Would that be okay? I don't know. Um, there's so many different types. So, how about if I choose Purex to so a safer cleaning product? But whoever asked this question, um, you see that there's four pages of this. So, just in the sense of time, I'll just um, do this. This may take a second. Okay, so for their um, for EWG, the Environmental Working Group, they put a general score of C. This is like just like your um, report card. So C plus, it gets a C plus. And then you can see some general ideas, general categories of what they think in terms of asthma and respiratory, some concern, skin allergies and irritation, again, some concern, and some concern among all of these. Developmental and reproductive toxicity, cancer, and the environment. And um, by the way, so how do, you can look at how it rates, and you can say here if you wanted to search for a better one. Okay, we won't do that now, but search for a better one. And then I just want to show you after these general categories, and you see sort of where it falls. Then it starts taking all the known ingredients, and again, not all ingredients will be known, um, and it'll take each ingredient and give it a score. So, for example, in this product is dimethicone, and it is a moderate concern because of um, its ability to biodegrade in the environment. Um, Ethydrionic acid, um, so may uh, biodegrade degradation again, and some skin um, irritation and allergy, some organ effects, damage to vision. Again, fragrance, fragrance is a disclosure concern, okay? So again, that's because it's a trade secret. Alkyl ethoxylates, which we talked about, that has a moderate concern. Um, and then it talks to you about all the concerns. And again, you'll see this concern from 1,4-dioxane, which is that, um, uh, byproduct that is unintentionally produced. So again, you're going to see it goes on and on. And water gets an A though. <laughs> um, <laughs> hydrogen peroxide gets an A. So these are some of the things for Purex. So now what was the next one? Um, so we have Windex. Is a, I think a lot of people use Windex and okay. also Febreze fabric spray. Okay, so let's try Windex try first. Windex. So here we have Windex. Um, do you want to go with the, let's see, which one is the most best? Well, we'll just start with the top one. This one actually gets a B. So that's that's a B plus, I guess, here. 
and it's the fresh citrus scent. And you'll see that again, it in this category, it has no data. Now, this is another piece to the puzzle is that again, there's not enough data for them to talk about it. Um, they may not even know all the products. So it says here ingredient disclosure. They're good at that. Green certified, no. Um, top scoring factors is some concern for chronic aquatic toxicity, general systemic and organ effects and acute aquatic toxicity. And then it'll talk to you about different versions of the product, which, you know, I won't go into right now um, because I want to just uh, talk about Febreze. Oh, there's a typo. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll talk think... about this. I think it's it? one E. I think it's F E B R E Z E. Like this? I, th I think. I think that's it. Okay. Let's try that. So you're not very good at the spelling thing. Okay, you're right. There we go. So you see that these products get a, a grade of C. And and also bounce. I know my mom uses bounce. <laughs> And um, this is one of those that make me uh, really, uh, I can't, I can't bear the smell of it myself, but um, so Febreze um, is an air freshener. If we took the Hawaiian scent, which we know we'd rather be in Hawaii than, than having some chemists make us a Hawaii, right? Um, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever been to Hawaii. <laughs> Um, but you see that skin and allergies and irritation, the environment are the two categories that have some concern. And then they give you all the different Febrezes. And the, I like this because it's the date that it's been entered. And that's important because, as I said, there is so many um, varieties of these things and companies keep changing the ingredients. And so you'll see that this was entered in 2022. So this is the most recent one, whereas the date entered in these are older. So you may want to go to this one, you know, assuming that this is the most current one and some concern for respiratory effects, acute aquatic toxicity and skin irritation. So, okay, so I am done. I'm going to stop sharing this screen for a bit um, and go back to sharing my other screen. Um, is everybody back with me on this? Yep, we're back on the PowerPoint. Okay, Great everybody. Job. So thank you for your responses to this. And now you know how to do it yourself and where you can go right here. Um, and, and we talked about this, but the one thing I wanted to tell you is one thing I put in was simple green, all-purpose wipes. And the thing I want to get out for you to say is this gets a score of D, even though it has the word green in it. So this is a myth you want to be really careful of is that if it says green natural eco-friendly then it's safe and environmentally friendly and this is not necessarily the case so you can try it yourself with this website um and you know me as i learned about things i used to you know think that if it said green it meant something but that's not necessarily true you want it to be third party certified so I'm going to talk very briefly about why is it on the shelf if it's not safe. So the Toxic Substances Control Act, also known as TUSCA, came about in 1976. And this is the first time chemicals in commerce were being regulated. So 1976. Um, and all these chemicals, as I said, um, can you not hear me? Somebody can't hear me. I'm on, I'm not on mute. So are you on mute? Um, whoever was saying that. No, um, I'm gonna. If you I'm can, Alyssa, if you can real quick. help her. I hope everybody else can still hear me. So Lynn, I don't see a microphone for you. Um, I do want to mention that at the beginning of the chat, if you scroll up, there's an option that you can join from your telephone. Um, it, you can call that number and the password is there for phones as well. Uh, you can still watch on your on your screen. It might be something with your computer. And Ed so said he can hear us. 
Yeah, we we can oh, hear fine. Okay. I can see she doesn't have a microphone lit up under her name, Lynn. So if you want to call in, that's the quickest way to resolve. Okay. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Okay, so anyway, here is the first time these chemicals were regulated and the why it was a very weak law and this is the industry really lobbied against this um, and the underlying assumption here is that a chemical is safe until it's proven unsafe. Now imagine if that was the underlying assumption to the medicine that you take from the pharmacy. You wouldn't buy it, right? Because you're not going to buy something and use it. And then like if 10 people start uh, having a problem, they're like, oh, well, maybe there's a problem with this. No, but this is how they dealt with chemicals in commerce is that it's safe until it's proven safe, unsafe. And um, health and safety data at this for this law was not required by the manufacturer at all. They had no response, they produced it, but they didn't have any responsibility for showing if it was safe. But the proof of the safety fell on the EPA, the regulatory body. Now, you know, as I know, that um, you know, EPA's funding goes up and down. And to really prove well the safety of any one chemical is a long process, imagine 85,000. Okay, so you get the grip of why sometimes this is kind of hard. Um, for the EPA to do. So as, um, and by the way, this law came about, because um, we remember Rachel Carson, we remember all those activists that came about and say, hey, something's wrong with the environment, um, birds are dying, um, we're experiencing um, health effects, somebody needs to do something. And they created Tusca in 1976, but it was just very, very weak. Um, this is a dip, uh, sort of my ability, my tr way to try and show you um, a little bit um, in a pictorial why, what is the difference? Here's the original Toxic Substances Control Act, that very weak law. And what you can see is that the EPA had only 90 days to determine risk. Now, I used to work in a lab and I can tell you that 90 days isn't a effective. You can't do that much in 90 days to determine. It can be like sketchy, but that's the best that they could do in 90 days. Um, and you should also be aware that since 1976, uh, even you know, as chemicals are being produced, so also is the ability to detect them. You know, scientists are always working on better ways to understand effects and better ways to see them more quickly. So um, in this original law, there is a very high burden of proof to demonstrate unreasonable risk, which is the way that the law was written. So that this high burden of proof was so high that the EPA really could, I think did less than five to, de uh, to ban a chemical because it was such, and there's so many lawsuits um, happening. And this confidential business information was a very broad claim. So Companies could just say it's confidential, so sorry, can't tell you. Um, and and health and environment was a risk trade-off with economics. So if it looked like pulling this chemical from the economy was more deleterious monetarily than the risk to health and environment, then the economy won. Now, um, time goes by and people are still feeling the effect. The environment are still feeling the effect because of this weak law. Meanwhile, Europe is changing their laws to become much more stricter. And what has pushed this law into action then actually was that industry be began realizing that they could now no longer sell to Europe because of their strict laws and they better change their products and so we were lucky because then that meant we got safer products. So there's a revised Toxic Substances Control Act. It's still not as strong as it could be, but it's better because now health and the environment are the first things that are taken into account. Risk is based only on that and not on cost. And vulnerable populations like children, like immunocompromised, like elders, like those with chronic diseases are explicitly protected by this law. So, and there's no longer this, this broad claim to confidential business information. So those were some of the changes, I'm not gonna tell you them all, from, for this revised law that made things a little bit better. That happened in 2016. So it took 40 years. 
was that 40? Yeah, 40 years. So let's switch gears now and talk about the warning labels that you see on your products. Highest hazard is when you see those words on your product called danger and poison. If you see words called caution and warning, that means it's a little less hazardous. And then it's the safest when you don't see any of those words at all on the product. And also lots of people, including um, sometimes myself, we, we forget to look and follow those directions. You always wanna use the right dilution. You wanna use adequate ventilation and wear gloves, et cetera, when they say to do that. Those, those are there for a reason. I wanna just real quickly say, I know we have 10 minutes, 11 minutes left. Um, what's the difference between cleaning, sanitizing and disinfecting? So when you clean something, you're removing the germs and the dirt, you're using soap, you're using water and you're scrubbing. Um, and that's gonna remove about 98% of the bacteria and 93% of viruses from surfaces when you use a microfiber cloth, which I'll talk to you about later, um, and water. Just with microfiber cloth and water, um, you're gonna be doing this. You need, if you're gonna disinfect a surface, you need to clean before you disinfect. It doesn't work well at all if you're gonna disinfect a dirty surface, Even, you know? So remember that. So what is sanitizing then? It reduces, but not necessarily eliminates the number of germs to a level that's considered safe by public health standards. So this is why when you go to a restaurant, um, and all these people are eating from the same plate and fork and spoon. Um, they're not disinfecting, obviously, because disinfectants are pesticides. They're not disinfecting these spoons and forks and they're sanitizing them. They're removing the germs to a level that's considered safe by public health standards. And this um, can, as sanitizers are registered for use, you have to look at the label, either for a porous surface, like a carpet or use furniture, stuffed animals, you know, things like that, or a non-porous surface like floors and walls, et cetera. And so sanitizers, depending upon which kind, can include a type of sanitizer that can be food contact or a type of sanitizer that is not for food contact. And you really have to know, look at the label. And some ideas of sanitizing, they're not all chemicals. There's sometimes it's dishwashers. You may even have a dishwasher that says sanitize. I know my sister does. And this is what's often used in restaurants. Um, and then disinfectants, they destroy germs but not necessarily their spores. And this, by spores, there are certain germs like TB, tuberculosis, that uh, have spores. And this is why TB is in particular very, very hard to get rid of. But the thing to know about disinfectants is that they're a registered pesticide. They're registered only for use on non-porous services or objects. And not all disinfectants kill the same germs, so you need to read the label. We know that with COVID, there is an EPA site that tells you which products disinfectants will kill the COVID vaccine, which ones would kill TB, for example. Disinfectants um, are only needed to be used when they need to be used. You don't use disinfectants everywhere around your house. Um, so that is not necessary. I know people have, uh, I saw a cartoon family circle once that uh, they used a disinfectant spray. The woman was holding a disinfectant spray around her child's crib. Um, no, you don't need to do that. Maybe cleaning and sanitizing or just cleaning with a microfiber cloth would be quite adequate and protect the child. So if you use bleach, there's a danger. You never ever wanna mix bleach with any other chemical because toxic gases can be produced. Um, if you mix bleach with ammonia, um, and ammonia again is found in glass and window cleaners, it's in litter boxes, diaper pails because it's in urine. Um, you can get chloramine gas, and this is a, a, a very fatal gas. So you do not wanna be exposed to that. 
and bleach and acids should never ever be mixed because you can get chlorine gas being produced, which is used in World War II. And um, so, and we know and have read about these sad effects. Um, so acids are found in vinegar. We're gonna talk about vinegar because that's a nice uh, thing to use for safer cleaning, but it's an acid. Um, drain cleaners are strong acids, toilet bowl cleaners, strong acids, some window cleaners. So you never wanna mix bleach basically with any other chemical. Um, so please remember that. The effects on you could be coughing, nausea, shortness of breath, watery eyes, chest pain, et cetera. But in the worst situations, like you're sticking your head in your oven, you're sticking your head in your tub, which is sort of like an enclosed space, this can concentrate these gases and um, cause pneumonia and fluid buildup in the lungs, which is basically what happened in World War II to soldiers. Um, because chlorine gas is fatal at high levels. And not only is it is absorbed through your lungs, but it's absorbed through your skin. Um, and people with asthma or heart and lung problems really should not be using bleach or ammonia. So what are we gonna do for safer products? Um, I have about six minutes to tell you about these things. Um, so we're gonna shop for products that list all the ingredients. That's the first thing. Biodegradable are plant-based and not petroleum-based. Now, again, you're gonna see this more often on some dishwashing um, things, we're plant-based. It used to be, and maybe still is for some things, that the surfactants, the soapy thing was, somehow produced from petroleum-based products. That is pH neutral. So this is very important. Not a strong acid like some toilet bowl cleaners, not a strong base like some oven cleaners. Um, you wanna look for things that are packaged in a pump spray, not an aerosol can, because now you're being exposed to more chemicals through the aerosol. Um, and our third party certified, we mentioned this. It's not good enough to be called green because I can put green on any label I want to, um, but that it's either third party certified. And you will sometimes see this uh, in your grocery store. This is one example of a third party certified. It's the Safer Choice by US EPA. And I'm giving you their website. We're not, we don't have time to go over it here, but the EPA Safer Choice website is another good website like the EWG, the Environmental Working Group website, to look for products that have been, um, in this case, third party certified, which means they have some um, regulations before they can get this label. They have to meet certain standards before this label is put on their product. So in terms of disinfectants, again, um, they're registered pesticides. You use them only when needed. Body fluids, feces, use them correctly. Remove the dirt first and use the appropriate contact time. This is also very important. A lot, a lot of people may spray a disinfectant somewhere. And again, you don't need to spray them everywhere. This is a, a limited spaces. And then they wipe them off immediately. Well, that's not gonna do any good. And in fact, it's not gonna do what you want it to do because the, it's not interacting with the germs enough time. And it also has the opportunity to produce those super bugs because you're giving them just a slight bit of contact to this, but not enough to kill them. And then they say, oh my God, what if I see this again? And they become, um, they can change their genetic material to be um, re um, resistant. Um, never mix bleach with other chemicals and cleaners, again, toxic gas. And remember that people with asthma and heart and lung problems shouldn't use, be using these. What is safer? A soap and water, microfiber cloth, and clean high touch surfaces frequently. These are very, your toolbox for being safe from germs for most of your house. Just plain soap and water, microfiber cloth. Okay, here are some solutions. Vinegar, baking soda, Castile soap, water, olive oil if you're gonna be making your own um, furniture polish, but I would suggest maybe another oil that is more stable um, of a plant-based oil. Microfiber cloths, mozo bags, and these are your, um, Get a bucket, put all these ingredients in, and this is your kit for cleaning your house. Um, Want to talk a little bit about Castile soap? 
The only Castile soap that I know of is Dr. Bronner's, which you can find in many grocery stores um, or different places. Uh, microfiber cloths, I said I would talk a little bit about them. They have a very high surface area. And this is why, and they're made out of a certain material. And this is why that they are very good at picking up bacteria because of the surface area. When you use an old rag, an old t-shirt, you're sort of smudging around the germs all over the place, but you're not necessarily picking them up very effectively. Microfiber cloths will. Microfiber cloths need, however, to be specially treated. Like don't wash them with things that create a lot of lint because that's going to clog up all those nice fibers. Don't heat them. Don't do hot water with them. Um, don't use them with very, very strong chemicals. Just soap and water, good enough. And then I want to talk about mozo bags. So mozo bags, instead of using Febreze, we want to use mozo bags. These are bamboo charcoal. And um, I've had people use these for a musty closet, things like that. And they're like, wow, this really works. So you use this little grommet hole, put a little nail in, in your closet and hang this up. This is so sustainable that you put it in your closet. After a month of being there, you put it out in the sun to rejuvenate it. You bring it back and put it in your closet. And then a month later, you put it out in the sun and rejuvenate it, and you continue that for a year. And then it's so sustainable that you can just put it in your garden and let it biodegrade. Lots of people have tried this and like them. There are many products similar to Mozo bags. They're not called Mozo, but this is the one that I know of. Um, so it's bamboo charcoal. Microfiber cloths, bamboo charcoal. So people have asked me, what do these green, green cleaning um, ingredients do. We know that baking soda is a mild abrasive and it's an odor absorber. We know that white, white vinegar is an acid, a weak acid. Again, never mix it with bleach, but it's great at dissolving soap scum and it helps to deodorize. Um, I had a friend who told me she uses vinegar whenever her young daughter throws up on the car seat. <laughs> and after five minutes of not smelling, of smelling the vinegar, the, the car seat feels much better. Liquid soap, again, Castile soap. Um, it cuts grease, cleans. Olive oil and other oils will help shine. And then you can add a few drops of essential oil. And essential oils can be expensive. You can go to the grocery store in the baking aisle and use these um, less concentrated pepper or peppermint and things. Just make sure it's the pure stuff, but you'll have to use more. And I want to just show you, I think, am I, Alyssa, over time? You know what? We're good. We can go. Um, we can go a few minutes over if if need be. So take your time and finish up, okay. please. Okay. So I'll just want to tell you that Alyssa is going to share with you because um, I've done this cleaning workshop last year for University Express, a green cleaning booklet, and you can um, download it or, or call her up and ask um, um, for it. Um, but it, basically, it's on. Um, she'll she can send you this as a link. And you can just have it, but this is a very popular all purpose cleaner recipe that everybody loves um, on. It's very simple 2 cups of water, 2 cups of Castile soap, like Dr. Bronner's 2 teaspoons of vinegar, half a teaspoon of baking soda. That's it. You mix the ingredients all in a spray bottle and you spray it on a surface. And you might want to use it with a damp cloth because it gets kind of soapy. You don't need too much of it. And the damp cloth will remove the thin soap film. You can use it in your microwave oven. You can use it uh, counter cabinets, um, bathroom. Um, and this recipe was tested by the Turi lab. This is where I originally got a grant to start these workshops when I was in Massachusetts. It's the Toxics Use Reduction Institute. And um, in this lab, if you go, go to Turi, you'll find even more information if you're really into it. Um, and they found that it performed at the same level as Formula 409 all-purpose cleaner. Oven cleaning made simple. Okay, instead of using a um, oven cleaner that is a very, uh, can cause, have products that can 
can cause asthma and there's also a strong base. How about just using baking soda and water? And this is a great recipe because after dinner, when your oven is cooled, you just sprinkle baking soda on the bottom of your oven and you spray it until it's really moist and um, you keep spraying it until you go to bed to keep it moist. And then you make a thick paste of baking soda with water and you coat the sides of the oven, a little difficult, but still. And then you spray it lightly with water to keep it moist if it dries out. And the great thing about all this is then you go to bed and you wake up in the morning and then you wipe off the grime. Most of this grime will then just come out um, with these two ingredients. So I tried this on my oven when I was in Massachusetts and it worked like a charm. There's there's some spots, obviously, if you have a really baked in some stuff, you might use to use elbow grease, but still. Um, this is one of the nicest recipes we, I've ever seen because it's very relaxing. <laughs> um, and then um, in the booklet that um, Alyssa will share with all of you, there's also recipes for a toilet bowl cleaner. So you really don't, a toilet bowl cleaner does not require such a strong acid. Um, you can just use soap, soap, vinegar and baking soda is a good, good recipe for a toilet bowl cleaner. And also, um, you know, if you want to keep your drains um, working fine, and obviously this is not going to um, degrade, you know, um, hair and things, but the scum that's around your um, sink, like in your bathroom and stuff, um, you could just regularly use baking soda and water and make a little mix and pour it down the drain. And it's going to then pour some vinegar in it and you'll see that it's going to bubble up and it's going to help loosen that scum. You can pour some hot water then down there. You can use a little plunger and plunge it. That helps too. But you can do that regularly to keep your drains kind of flowing good and clean, which may help you avoid using these very strong um, acids for um for your drains and again never use this recipe because again baking soda vinegar bubbles up gases don't ever use that recipe if you've already previously used some drain cleaner and not like rinsed it out really thoroughly because the drain cleaner could still be settling in the elbow of the sink so you want to just really 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 um do that um Dishwashing soap, somebody asked, is that safe? So take a look at your dishwashing soap um, and at, look for those things that I mentioned to you. Is it biodegradable? Is it plant-based? Is it listing all the ingredients? If you are lucky, it may also have that third-party certification on it. So that's how I use mine, is I look for um, a dishwashing soap that says that. I would never use a, bake, uh, a dishwashing soap that said antibacterial. And it, by the way, they've gotten away from putting antibacterial in soaps because um, I think it's the FDA asked um, in, um uh, manufacturers, you know, to show them the data that shows it's any better than just plain soap and water, and they couldn't. So plain soap and water is just good enough. You don't need the antibacterial in it. And then I just want to go over cost. So if you think about how much you spend on average for household cleaners, you can just think in your head. I did this kind of um, analysis several years ago, but I bought um, baking soda, white vinegar, and Dr. Bronner's. I bought the biggest ones I could, came to $19. Then I bought, then I did a survey of the grocery store aisle and I took three um, all-purpose cleaners and I averaged them, toilet bowl, et cetera, glass cleaners. I averaged them to the average cost and compared it to how much I could make with the green cleaners versus how much I needed to buy for the same amount of pre-made cleaners. And I found that this came to $47, this came to $19. And both of these were enough uh, for nine quarts of all-purpose cleaner, four quarts of toilet bowl cleaner, one quart of glass cleaner, and I could clean the oven two times. So again, you're saving money plus any healthcare costs. Um, and so that's another good reason, economically, environmentally, social justice, environmental justice, and your health, all good reasons. So now let's just say at the end here that you've 
have your household cleaners, you've listened to this webinar and you're like, geez, you know what? I'm gonna start changing. So now what do you do with your old household cleaners? Do not throw them down the drain or in the street because they can pollute the water, they can harm aquatic life. So you wanna dispose of them properly. And um, all of us probably live in a county. I know Erie County does this. So we're all probably from Erie County. They hold household hazardous waste drop off days and they take household cleaners and it's a free disposal. You just need to look for the dates. It's usually around spring and in the fall. Um, and so you call them for more information, get yourself on the website. I know I get the notices of when they're coming. And um, and then you can just make an appointment for your little slot, take all your ho household cleaners and anything else that you wanna dispose of properly there and you're good. So, okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. And I see that we have 15 attendees still here. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, so we have one at the excellent program. In addition to doing most of the cleaning at my home, I am also affiliated with the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper, which often speaks to the public about the kind of things we put down the drain and their effects on water quality, which is a great point. Um, and I love that that was part of your presentation because it's things that people normally don't think of as much. Right. Not as much, right. Now, Not Don, we had a question before that. Is Don dishwashing so particularly environmentally friendly? Um, I know we always see those commercials where they're cleaning the little baby ducks from the ocean with Don. Oh, so do you, would you yes, agree that's with really that? True. Do you know what? I honestly, I would look at that EWG website because I don't know off the top. I don't use Don. And, okay. and I don't know off the top of my head, there's so, so many, right? You go to the cleaning aisle and you're surprised, like, you know, how many there are. So um, I would look it up because Dawn also is always changing. So look it up. Um, I would be interested okay. myself with EWG um, website. But thank you for asking that question. And I hope you do get on the website. Are, is that person able to get on the website, by the way? You know what, I, um, everyone, you can reach me through, um, you have my email through WebEx um, when you registered. Um, you can reach me there or my direct line here is 858-8793 um, with Erie County. I'd be happy to um, talk you through it if, you, if you're having problems with it. Uh, give me about 15 minutes after the class to get the email out to you with the green clean um, recipe book that um, Donna was so nice to provide with us. Um, and we will have this class online. Um, it takes about a week for us to post, but you can rewatch um, if you have questions about anything that we talked about today. Um, with that, uh, it looks like questions are, does anyone else have a question? I'll, I'll leave it open for one more minute. Uh, I and wanna I thank just, Donna too for this I just wonderful wanted class. To Oh, Alyssa, thank you. I just wanted to say that I pulled it up. I hope I'm sharing the screen with all of you about Dawn, just in case that person who asked that question doesn't have the a computer oh. easily available. So just saying, and but thank you, Alyssa, you can continue. I'm sorry to have this. I was going to now see that's very interesting <laughs> looking at this. Um, I really, I, I think it's great advice to check your specific brand because I was using the, the foam. Um, myself personally, the Don Direct Foam, and look at that, the C plus. When if you use regular Don, you can it's an A or a B. So that's right. very interesting. Right. So and that this one says antibacterial, which is surprising to me. Um, you know that it did, that it has that. So you know. Um, you can check whoever asked that question which product you actually use. That's what I mean. They all are a little different. So and then. Um, yes, I will send the, the book out Add to everyone. I have your email address from your, uh, when you registered. And um, we have a question um, also for how, do, how long does the all-purpose cleaner last? The recipe, um, Donna, that you, you presented everyone with oh, during this. Thank you for asking that. You know, I don't have a definitive answer on that. I make it myself and I just keep using it until it's gone and I make a double recipe. And I, um, so I don't know, that's, that's maybe about, mm, 
four cups is a quart. Is that right? <laughs> four cups is a quart and I divvy it out to half in my kitchen and half. I have a spray bottle in my kitchen for it and I have a spray bottle in the bathroom for it. Um, but on that website is, um, as you say, that some cl many cleaners contain some chemicals that are preservatives like BHT. Um, but um, in the website, I think I've forgotten. I think it's vitamin E that may be able to be used um, as a preservative. Um, in some of your products, if you want to do that, uh, don't quote me because I don't have it in front. Oh, do I have it in front of me? I do. Um, let me, let me check that with you. Um, let's see. Okay. Vitamin E can be used as a preservative agent. So you can buy vitamin D E I think in like the, um, aisles where they sell little, um, um, essential oils and things. I'm not sure. I don't use it myself, but, but, but yes, you can um, put that in too. So that's a great question. And thank you for whoever asked that. Okay. It looks like, it looks like questions have all been answered. So everyone thank on behalf of university express, thank you so much for joining us today. And Donna, it was a fantastic class. One of the best ones I've seen this semester. So thank you everybody. And uh, Donna, do you have a moment? I can, yes. we can chat privately after sure. okay, I'm going to stop the recording. Everyone have a wonderful day. Nice Hope to, to meet all, all of you. Soon.